Um, my name is Betty Siegel. I'm the director of VSA and Accessibility here at the Kennedy Center, and I don't often get the opportunity to do this, which is stand on stage and welcome the audience to the Kennedy Center. Um, there are some things I do have to say, so they wrote it down for me. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us this evening's, for this evening's Millennium Stage presentation, which is brought to you by Target and the Marriott Foundation. And as a courtesy to this evening's artists, and other audience members, we do ask that you turn off your mobile devices. I'm turning mine off now. And that photography and recording of any kind during the performance is prohibited. The Millennium Stage presents a free performance at 6 p.m., 365 days a year, and all of our, all of our performances are broadcast live and are available on de demand at www.kennedy-center Org. Now, this evening's performance is brought to you by the Office of VSA and Accessibility at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. We are the International Gene Kenny Smith Arts and Disability Program here at the Kennedy Center. And we are dedicated to providing opportunities in the arts for people with disabilities of all ages. So this evening is particularly um, important to us as the Kennedy Center and in honor of John F. Kennedy's values and service to the country. We're very excited to be able to support our veterans and military families tonight. And we really look forward to a great performance by, by these writers. Now, without further ado, I would like to welcome to the stage our host for the evening, Chris Albers. Good evening. Welcome to Writing Truth, stories from the military experience. I'm a board member of the Writers Guild Initiative and have been proud to be a mentor at numerous writing workshops where we have been fortunate enough to work with talented writers and veterans and caregivers that you'll be seeing here tonight. There are over 100 professional writers who volunteer their time to be mentors at our workshop throughout the country. Over 600 veterans and caregivers from every corner of our nation have taken part, including from states like Alaska and Hawaii. Tonight, we will show you examples of the works that have come out of those weekends and the people who have inspired us by opening up and sharing their most personal experiences. Many of the stories that you will hear tonight have never been shared with anyone before. After all they've been through, they have shown their bravery once again by opening up and exposing their most personal thoughts and stories. All of us at the Writers Guild Initiative are grateful to have gained the trust of these incredible veterans and caregivers. More importantly, we are so excited to encourage these wonderful men and women to explore writing as a way to cope with their past and to use writing as a new outlet to explore their future. Tonight, when you hear these stories, I hope you will feel as fortunate as I do to hear them told firsthand. We have a full program, so let's get started. Our first writer is Sharon Grassi. Sharon took part in one of the workshops we held in Denver, Colorado. Sharon is a technical writer and graphic designer with a BS in technical communications from Arizona State University. She and her husband live in Mesa, Arizona. They have four grown children, one granddaughter, and five dogs. Currently, Sharon is working as a veteran caregiver for her son, Derek Tope, a three-time deployed combat medic and infantrymen who has chronic post-traumatic stress disorder, post-concussion syndrome from multiple traumatic brain injuries, and multiple physical injuries. Here is Sharon's story. Thank you, Chris, and thank you to the Writers Guild, Wounded Warriors Project, and the Kennedy Center for giving us this opportunity. Waking. 
is the story. Coming from somewhere deep in my subconscious, where people lead non-existent but somewhat connected lives, I felt myself slip away from the dreamwalkers and slowly return to that normal, dark, comfortable, almost sleep state. As I lifted layers of fog, the logic part of my brain began to function again, and I let myself wonder at something anxious and unknown. Then the next ring came from the phone. Again, the fog lifted a bit, more logic seeped in, and then panic crept in. In a rush, I was fully me, knowing what a call meant in the middle of the night. A quick check to the clock said 2 a.m. Another jolt of adrenaline laced with fear as my body began to move. It was as if it was on its own agenda, not needing a nudge from me any longer. I have no memory of the run down the hall, only memories of whether I will make it on time. Why didn't I put a phone next to the bed? Who will be on the other line? Please, God, let it be Derek. Did the flowers fall over? Did I step on the dog? I had no idea in my crazed state that had now grown to almost hysteria because I was sure he was injured. Sorry. <clears throat> then I heard his voice, not a doctor or a commander. He sounded small and pained. I could tell. Even though he was thousands of miles away, it was Derek. And yes, he was okay. But his buddy had just died. He was a good friend who had been with him through boot camp and medic training. They both volunteered for the mission, but he was chosen. He died in an IED explosion earlier that day. I wasn't prepared for this. I joined mom's groups, learned the cliches, packed the boxes. I had websites that told me what rank a soldier was by the shape of his badge. Other sites that told me the difference between a fob and a cop. And a site that counted down the days till my son came home. But this, I racked my brain for a response that would help my son deal with. Are you okay? I heard myself ask. It sounded heartless and ineffectual, even to me. He said, they asked me to talk at his service, but I said no. I talked to the higher-ups about him, though, so they would know what to say about him at the service. We're so new that nobody knew anything about him. I could feel his pain, and I could tell he was waiting for something from me. In this moment, he was not their soldier. He was my boy, counting on me for something, anything. But there was nothing. I had no words of comfort, and nothing that would take the pain away. We made a pact to volunteer for every mission. We were going to stick together, but I was on patrol when they called him out. Derek, this is horrible. What can I do? What a failure as a mom. All my preparation, all my military mom pride, and now I was asking him for help. The commanders and the guys are taking care of me, Mom. I'll be okay. Are you sure you're okay? I gotta get going. They only let me call because they knew you would think it was me when it hit the news. My buddy, Crombie, was a 19-year-old medic from Arizona who was deployed to Ramadi with 1st Armored Division, just like me. We should be in a communications blackout right now, but they wanted me to call you so you wouldn't worry. I can't talk long. My sleep-drenched, adrenaline-charged brain was now trying to pull something profound from the depths of my mom bag. I dug deep, but there was nothing on dead soldiers. I gotta go, Mom. I love you, dear. I love you too, Mom. And he was gone. I was back in my living room, alone. No tears, no waking my husband. No calling a friend. There was just nothing. I felt like I was back in my dream. And the color drained from the room, and I was alone, thanking God 
that someone else's child died instead of mine. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Next, we have Lauren Levin. Lauren was educated in the US and Europe and undergraduate and has undergraduate degrees in sociology and religious studies. Lauren is a well-traveled global citizen. She is the mother of two young children and the wife of retired Sergeant William Finizzi, a former frontline medic in Afghanistan and wounded warrior. Lauren is a tier three caregiver, a dole fellow, and an advocate for caregivers across the nation. Please welcome Lauren Levin. Thank you for the introduction, Mr. Albers. I am so honored to be here. Before I share my story with you, I would just like to start with this. This is not my writing sample, nor is this my resume. This is my husband's Department of Veteran Affairs VA disability rating letter showing all 23 of his disabilities, the majority of which are combat related. You see, this is what motivated me to be here today. And this is what has inspired me to write the story that I'm about to share, the story I call That Day. That day, my husband returned home from Afghanistan with invisible injuries from the war. So here I go with that day. I hope you enjoy. I finally got the phone call that I waited for. 395 days later, a voice told me that my husband had made the manifest. The cold, stoic voice said, you can pick up your soldier, 6631, at 1400 hours today. Before I could say thank you, the phone line went dead. I just sat in my car, staring at my phone in complete shock. My mind was paralyzed. I had no idea whether to cry, laugh, or smile. I just sat there, frozen. Eventually, my son started crying, and I immediately put the phone down and headed back home to get ready for his arrival. It was 8 AM, and I had six hours until I could hug my husband again, and a laundry list of things to do. I guess in my mind, I thought I'd have more notice of his arrival I thought I'd have time to obsess over cleaning my house, picking out the right outfit, and all of those other unimportant yet necessary things. In reality, I got six hours. I immediately began scrubbing my house inside and out. I wanted to leave no stones unturned. I wanted everything perfect. Not good, not great, but perfect. He is a soldier and a medic, and in his world there is no second best. As I was on my hands and knees scrubbing my kitchen floor, I began to cry. I had yet to feel excited about my husband's arrival. I was not feeling exhilarated and ecstatic like I thought I would. I had been dreaming about this day, recreating scenarios in my mind and predetermining my emotions. Nothing was like I planned. I was nervous and scared. I was actually terrified. My husband had been gone for over a year. He missed a huge gap of our life, and we missed a huge gap of his. It was almost like a stranger was coming home. I had no idea what he did or saw for over a year. Phone calls were limited, and our conversations were superficial and brief when he called. Now he was coming home, and I didn't even know him. What was I going to say? I was lost. I continued to sob until the overbearing smell of bleach continued. continued to encourage me to stop scrubbing. Once I finished cleaning my house, I immediately started to get my son dressed to greet our soldier. I dressed my son in a perfect mini ACU uniform to mirror his father, and I even got the name patches sewn on. I was dressed in a dress that my husband always told me was his favorite. I made sure my hair was perfect, and I doused myself with his favorite perfume. I wanted to stand out in the crowd for him. After we got dressed, we headed to the special events center. I knew he was arriving at 1,400 hours, but I wanted to be there early. I wanted to get front row seats so he could see us when he walked in. 
I strapped my son in the car seat, and as I buckled myself in, I took a deep breath. I was hoping this reunion would be wonderful and happy, but I had not yet convinced myself of that. When we arrived in the parking lot at the Special Events Center, it was 12 p.m. and there was no parking. It was so crowded I had to double check that I had not missed his homecoming. As I began to unload my son from the car, I noticed a handful of other wives. Every single one of them looked stressed and panicked, but they were all perfectly dressed, and I could smell the different scents of perfume as I headed towards the front door. I awkwardly held my son and my cardboard sign as we made our way towards the entrance. As I opened the front door, I could hear the song YMCA blasting from the inside. There was a bounce house for children and a huge projection screen showing soldiers touching ground on American soil. It was like a carnival, yet no one was participating. Everyone was just sitting there nervously waiting for 1,400 hours to come. I immediately walked up to the projection screen to see if I could see a face shot of my husband. I stood holding my son watching the entire video twice. Finally, a hand tapped me on the shoulder and said, Lauren, look, there's Billy, see him? I got a quick glimpse of what appeared to be my, my husband and barely recognized him. He looked 40 pounds slimmer and his ear to ear smile was replaced with a stone cold face. I actually had to stand there again to watch the entire video because I was not convinced that the person I saw was my husband. I stood in front of the screen, blocking the views from others watching from the bleachers. I had to know if that was him. When the rotation came back around, I got a good look and realized it was, in fact, my husband. I couldn't believe I couldn't even recognize my husband. What was it going to be like when I saw him in less than an hour? Would I find him in the crowd? Would he recognize me? My mind wandered as I walked over to the bleachers to find a seat. I sat down in the first available space, completely forgetting that I wanted to be in the front row. This was it. It was the day I had dreamed of. I had watched countless YouTube videos of homecomings, and now it was our day, and it was nothing like I had envisioned. As the media began to set up for the homecoming, everyone on the bleachers began to shuffle. I immediately fixed my son's collar, checked my hair, and double-checked to make sure our sign was facing the right way. I took a quick gaze around the room and noticed all of the wives were doing the same thing. We all looked the same. My special outfit wasn't so special, and his favorite perfume would never be smelled due to the menagerie of scents coming from the bleachers. Before I could even obsess about anything else, a single soldier walked to the center of the stage. He just stood at attention, showing no signs of emotion as crowds cheered and banners waved. <clears throat> Eventually, a voice over the loudspeaker said, Welcome home, 112 Infantry. I heard a loud bang, and the back doors of the building opened, and soldiers began marching to the center of the room. They methodically formed up behind their commander, one after another. They continued to march in, and my eye was fixated on the door. I was hoping I would spot my husband. When the whole group came through, they all stood at attention, waiting to be told what to do next. I didn't even have a chance to cheer or clap. I hadn't seen my husband in the crowd. I stared at every single soldier, row by row, looking to see my husband. Finally, I redirected my attention to the commander, and he told me the soldiers were dismissed. It was like a tsunami when they dismissed the soldiers. Everyone from the bleachers ran into the crowd of soldiers who were aimlessly waiting to be claimed. Ironically, I did not have to look long to find my husband. I found him right after I entered the storm. Once I found him in the crowd, I ran and gave him a huge kiss and immediately handed him our 19-month-old son. I guess I was subconsciously trying to create something out of those YouTube videos I had watched. When I stepped back to take a picture of him with our child, I noticed my husband looked perplexed. He awkwardly was holding our son and didn't even really smile or flinch. Once I noticed his odd look, I said, Billy, hasn't he grown? There was a dead silence amongst the chaos. My husband eventually said, here, you take him, and turned around to talk to a friend. I stood there clenching my son as my husband turned his back on us to converse with a buddy. I watched him shake his buddy's hand and tell him that he would be seeing him at the party tonight. I stood there waiting 
to be told what to do next. Eventually, my husband told me he was ready to go. He started walking towards the exit door. He didn't hold my hand, nor did he walk with us. My son and I walked behind him as we sifted through the crowds, trying to make our way towards the exit. Once we got outside, my husband said, where did you park? I pointed to the car. Once I got closer, I noticed he was standing in front of the wrong car. I screamed, Billy, that's not our car. As I was walking towards him, we're the next row, we're the blue Kia. He headed over to the next row and we met at the door. Once I got next to him, I jokingly asked him if he thought I surprised him with a white BMW. I was trying to make a joke that he opened the wrong car. He said nothing. He just looked at me and said, open the door, please. I pressed the unlock button and I got in the car and sat there. As I proceeded to get our son in the car, I peered into the passenger seat to check on my husband. I just knew he was sitting there laughing. I knew this was one big joke. He was surprising me. He was pretending like he didn't care and he was really gonna surprise me with something big. After I strapped my son in, I peeked at him one last time. He was just sitting there, looking straight ahead, emotionless. I walked back to the driver's seat, and I immediately got in my car. As I put the key in the ignition, I asked him if he was ready to go. I said, do you want me to stop back at that BMW? Hint, hint, is that my welcome home present? He didn't flinch. He continued to look straight ahead and said, just drive, Lauren. I said, okay and didn't mutter another word. I put the car in drive and nervously headed back to my house. It was a one mile drive, but it was the longest mile drive of my entire life. The car was dead silent. My son didn't even mutter a word. So we pulled up to our base housing. My husband noticed a huge banner in the front yard. The banner was a photo of him and it said, welcome home, baby. We've missed you so much. He stared at the poster as I pulled into the parking space. But before I could even put the car in park, my husband jumped out of the car and proceeded to walk around the back of our house. My son and I casually got out of the car and headed towards the front door. As I was unlocking my door, my husband ran up the steps and said, area secure. I said, what? He said, I searched the per perimeter and it's safe to enter now. I said, baby, I know, we're safe, we're home. He just looked at me. I nonchalantly said, we're home, it's safe, we live on base. He stopped me mid-sentence and said, wait, what? Where are we? I said, home. He just stared at me. As I started to get my son in the front door, my husband said to me, Lauren, I just don't remember. From that moment on, I knew my life had changed forever. Thank you. Before we continue with our veterans and caregivers, I'd like, you, I'd like to introduce you to the president of the Writers Guild Initiative. Michael Weller has been a successful playwright for the last four decades and wrote the screenplays for Ragtime and Hair. More importantly, Michael steers the ship at the Writers Guild Initiative, which provides the platform for all the written works you are hearing tonight. Please welcome Michael Weller. Thank you, Chris, and uh, thank you, Wounded Warrior Project, for partnering with us in this writing venture. And of course, thank all of you for coming to hear this reading. I just want to put one thought out there. When we first thought of the project of uh, mentoring writers, we had no idea who to approach, who might want our, our services, our whatever you call it, our, our skills, until we finally put it in terms of we want to serve people with our writing, so who, who should we approach? And the answer quickly was, let's find people who served us, and these are servicemen. That's how this original idea took root. 
What's interesting to me in the course of all our work with these uh, soldiers and their caregivers is that we come away from these sessions so energized and so excited as writers, it's more as if they've given us a gift and served us in our work. So all I would like to leave you with is if there's any real gift that's been given here, it's been by the veterans and their care caregivers to us. And as Veterans Day approaches, I'd like to thank them so much for their service in every possible way. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Let's get back to the talented writers who we're here to honor. Next, we have Jason Rowell, who participated in one of the workshops we held in San Antonio. Jason is a Marine and was diagnosed with PTSD 16 months into his military service. He is alive today because of a dog he named Harley. Please give a warm welcome to Jason and his dear friend. Before I begin, this is Harley. She's a three and a half year old golden doodle, labradoodle. Uh, one parent was a golden retriever and poodle, the other is a labrador and poodle. Um, the title of my poem is So Got Made a Service Dog. And in 1929, God looked down on his creation and he said, I need a healer, so God made a service dog. God said, I need somebody willing to get up in the middle of the night to calm nightmares, to fall back asleep, only to get up, to go to work, come home, and be ready to do it all over again. So God made a service dog. I need somebody with paws strong enough to open up doors, but yet gentle enough to shake hands with a child. Somebody to navigate unruly crowds, and be willing to get stepped on and not ever growl, but respond with a slobbery smile. So God made a service dog. God said, I need somebody willing to stand by. When anger rages and tears are falling, and watch as someone really lives what they fight inside. Then walk over and get puppy dog eyes as if to say it'll be all right without ever saying a word. I need somebody who can remember to fetch meds, carry groceries or a carton of milk. Who can mold and patch someone so completely broken inside. And no matter the place, season, or time, must never take time off. And who would be willing to work for hugs, love, praises, and treats? So God made a service dog. God had to have somebody willing to fight in a war that nobody else could see. Yet stop crowds of people when they get too close. And do ever so craftily by seeking attention to get petted. It gives the person that they're with room and space to breathe. God said, I need to have somebody strong enough to be always faithful and always ready, yet gentle enough to break through doubts and fears and do so with a slobbery smile. Who would stop their friend and remind him, this will defend. It had to be somebody who'd come, lay, sit, stand, and stay when asked. Somebody who challenged them to aim high, to fly, to fight, to win.
and be an ever living reminder as they walked on by. You're here because somebody once thought, not for self, but for country. Somebody who take an injured veteran and make them whole, who would teach them how to cry, how to laugh, how to love. And smile again. Somebody who would live their whole life to hear somebody say, I'm here because of my dog. So God made me and veterans like me, a service dog. For those that are curious, 1929 is used because it's the year the service dog schools were first established. It was for blind veterans of World War I. All the branches of America's armed forces are represented in this poem by their mottos in English. In the order that they appear, United States Marine Corps, always faithful. United States Coast Guard, always ready. United States Army, this will defend. United States Air Force, aim high, fly, fight, win. United States Navy, not for self, but for country. And may you be as blessed as I am here today. And as always, Semper Fidelis, thank you. Here's a little secret. Jason told me backstage that Harley actually wrote that piece. <laughs> I'd now like to bring out Hector Matas Castile. He was also a member of our San Antonio workshop. Hector is a former Airborne Ranger, first sergeant, married to a former US Marine, and they now live in St. Paul, Minnesota with their five boys. Hector is now fully engaged in clinical social work developing programs, directing psychotherapists and bringing issues around mental health into the light. Let's hear Hector's story. So please join me on an existential journey. Teacher, what was it like when your number was called what was your question? How did you know? When did you know? The old man chuckled lightly. His gaze went up with his chin as if the story were written in the stars, somewhere in between past and future. With youthful wit to match the eager questions of his people, he began. Job was still whining. I remember it as if it were a real memory, but not sure if it was or is mine. He was throwing ashes on his head with Lucifer laughing and the archangels gambling over how long it will be before he starts to ask the unholiest of questions. Why me, God? Why? It was tense. I stood ready for when my number was called. All of us here know that when you hit the dirt in that forsaken place where even the strongest of the host fear to tread, you turn into a frail, hairless, completely dependent gob of soft flesh, atrophied muscles, speechless lips, sightless eyes, and unimaginably sensitive hearing. I heard tell that the sound of that place is like a loud buzz, where voices are muffled, and the mind is completely numb. Here, I could still hear and see the colors of the others, and the thoughts from their still fully awake minds. There, we become drooling messes of human being that defecate and urinate on themselves. It's filthy, it's disgusting, dirty, but every one of us knows that we'll get our turn. Teacher. I heard some of the others describe the smell down there as decay, something I can't really explain, but others have attempted to. Yes, I know the smell. It's like fresh, ripe, bright yellow bananas sitting on a countertop in the direct light of a star. They brown from the inside out. It's a sweet and flowery fragrance that screams out one last time before dropping in an odor so stale, so hairy, 
Its scent travels through the air like ivy into your nostrils. Deeply, quickly, its tendrils descend into your stomach, inciting a violent reaction from your innermost organs. And out through your mouth projects itself back into the air with whatever one ate most recently. Decay is when the maggots and the flies begin to buzz around. The gnats were the worst. Flies, maggots, and gnats only exist on Earth to feed off the dying things. Everything there is in a constant state of dying. This is a result of the exile. That's what the whole planet smells like. Imagine, if you can, the smell of a dead animal riding away in the desert. Imagine that dry heaving that takes place once the irony, damp, stale odor invades your sense of smell. That's what the whole planet smells like. Teacher, I heard some say that you never get used to the smell. <laughs> My people, you will be able to tell me at some point. Be prepared. For when the day comes that the great voice calls your number, you will feel as though you were shot out of your home and said goodbye to everything you knew for about a second. On earth, they call it birth. But time is something relative to where you are. It's said that you think differently as you forget everything you once knew. One moment, you knew you were created for eternity. And the very next moment, you realize you were born to die. When the great voice spoke my number and it was my turn, I was spoken into being. I remember that Job had just finished asking why. Gabriel taunted Michael for the prize of their waging. And God came forward unto Job and spoke unto him. You, stand like a fighter and answer this if you can. Where were you when I? Well, you get the point. That's what I guess I'm going into. I just hope I don't get to that why point. I hope to be one of those that remembers. One of the others, like Desjardins, when he was called out to that little marble-looking orb over there, through the darkness and into the milky white way in the center of the universe, he said that we are not human beings in a spiritual journey, but spiritual beings in a human journey. O'Donohue, one of the maker's favorites, said, that the veil is thin, and that we were not created physical beings with a soul within us, but physical beings within a soul. In case you're wondering why, it's because without that weak body and that numb brain, we would realize we don't have to stay there very long. We might try to fly back before our own why moment. It's hard to believe, but we actually forget that we can fly. I feel bad for that poor ash-covered bastard, but he's a good example of making it, I guess. What was I talking about? I was getting ready to be that poor bastard. This won't last forever. Then again, time is relative. When you arrive, there is a short period of time when you are protected from the elements. You hear things but are defenseless to the outside world. You are born. And ironically, your primal scream is at the same moment the beginning of your end. The others in my early life were my father, a relatively, a relatively cruel and disgruntled man who seemed to have lost his way. Many do. The trauma of existence apart from the maker is such that some lose their minds, and his was such a case. My mother was more than likely selected with special favor from the Creator. In her womb, hers was the only voice that reminded me that the Creator will not forget me. She was strong and loving, always nurturing while allowing me to fall. I was given a brother two years after my arrival. He was gifted in many ways that he was gifted in where we come from. But he was of a different caste altogether. He never knew war, and somewhat sadly, he also never knew peace. Time there is hard. It jades, you, it jades you and turns you cynical. Things move so quickly that you easily get caught up in the pummeling waves of activity. If it's not one thing taking you, it's another. And if you're not careful, you'll drown in the sea of life. I heard somewhere that a mystic dance is where the madman drowns. I guess, in all my wisdom, I thought that I needed to see what that meant. Where do adolescent men go to serve and figure out the problems of the world? The military. Something inside of me knew that I was meant for hard things and that I was meant to serve. For God and country felt like it had a hint of truth to it. A hint was better than not knowing at all. Fallibility, for what it's worth, led me to believe that killing others was going to answer that still growing why within me. No one on this planet seems to learn from the mistakes of those that have gone before them. So who am I to be any different? So... 17 years of knowing that I once knew everything had gone by. 
And the only truth to that statement is that I still believed that I knew everything at this age. There I was anyway, trying to figure it out as I stood to the right of the hallway, somehow feeling I was in a different world. I was in a maze of mat gray hallways where entropy seemed to reign. Order was being made out of sheer chaos, and not one single one of us knew where we were really headed to. Just one number standing in line behind another, waiting to be called forward. Every door was white, and every station had a uniform young person that seemed to be laughing at every single one of us as we checked into the next point and the next. I felt a sense of humility every time I approached another enormous metal gray desk, te another enormous metal gray desk with white countertop. I kept telling myself, just follow the yellow line. That's what marked the path to the next station on my check sheet. The yellow line on the pearly white floor showed signs of wear from the smudges of sneakers, and I wondered how many people almost wet themselves here. I was carrying a grip of paperwork in my left hand so much so that it felt heavy and my arm became numb. My knuckles weren't feeling any sensation since I started my death grip on a packet of forms I carried everywhere. I was so scared that the long edge was wet from sweat and rolled up into the shape of my knuckles. I felt that ticklish, anxious feeling in my lower abdomen. The acid in my stomach moved up through my throat like a river carrying my heart up into my mouth. It was hard to swallow. I had that constant feeling like I was either going to piss or crap myself. The smell of this place reminded me of the locker rooms of my adolescence, just before weigh-ins. Everyone had been cutting weight in plastic suits, and when we took them off, the trapped heat of our sweaty, slimy adolescent bodies overpowered the recently bleached area. You can tell that someone had scrubbed through this place with pinal just before we got there, but the smell of young, sweaty flesh filled the room. It's like a bunch of wet dogs getting inside a pickup truck after a full day of bird hunting. You can smell the breath of the recruit behind you. I started wondering what my breath smelled like. I yawned. Oh man, now I know. Morning puppy breath with hints of the soiled diaper it just ate. My breathing was shallow. I was sweating as I stood at the threshold of the door that had a sign that read, physical, in white engraved letters and a brown rectangular background with white trim. Funny, it was the only thing that had any color in it. It hung in stark contrast to all white and gray. A young brown-haired woodland camouflage soldier came out and looked at our paperwork through cold brown eyes. He didn't even look at us as he told us which line to get into as we entered the doorway. I desperately looked in his face for some kind of expression from him to tell me that everything was going to be all right. And for as much as this moment seemed novel, there was still something very familiar about it. My paperwork read, Ranger Contract, followed by the numbers and letters 11B0V. Whatever that meant, my number told this soldier that I would go to the farthest line in front of another white door with a small area where two small silver rails hung empty at about eye level. I got the impression that there was no sign made to describe whatever they call what was going to happen to me. I was the only one in that line. I wasn't feeling it at all. It was a sick, doomsday-like feeling, like being singled out for having done something wrong and being sent out to the principal's office waiting for your turn of chastising. That seemed too familiar to me, except that I knew the reason for that. In this case, I was wondering, what did I do wrong this time? Everyone looked at me as I kept walking further from the rest of the recruits. I must have looked like an alien to them as I was separated out. It wasn't long before the doctors in their white gowns started having them squat down and duck walk while maintaining a squatting position. And when they got to the end, they got the typical nut cup and cough to the left. Once in a while, someone would get yelled at for not turning their mouth. Turn your head, recruit. Didn't your mother teach any manners? Eventually, they were all turned to turn around bend over and spread their butt cheeks, while some creepy old guy with an overly inquisitive gaze and puckered lips looked into their buttholes for something. Whatever they saw was written down on the recruit's paperwork. My scrotum shrank and my anus puckered up, two things that only happened for the survival of the species, I thought. Turn around, recruit, someone will be there shortly, commented one of the old guys. And this one in particular, I would get to know more personally than the others. I wasn't sure how I got picked from my line, except that I'm guessing not all the guys were asking to be rangers. 17 years old and a state-ranked wrestler. You'd think that meant something, but that wasn't in my paperwork. Just the words, ranger contract. An 11B with a zero followed by a V. 
That same doctor that told me to turn around came over with that same stoic young guy and opened the door. He was about two inches taller than me, although that's relevant to my feeling like I was 12 inches tall. His hair was gray and black, combed neatly backwards in streaks. His glasses were thick black frames, like something out of a 50s educational film meant to tell us how to hide under our desks. His wrinkles were deep and gave me the impression that if he wasn't in his 70s, he had been squinting for a long time looking into young men's butt cracks. His hands seemed larger than average with thick fingers and would look like purplish swollen knuckles. Arthritis, I thought. Under his gown, all I could see were black dress shoes and a pair of black slacks. He had a slight bend on his back. I thought, what kind of a person fought in their calling to use the gift of healing others to look into the buttholes of young men in their prime? I shook the question out of my head. Airborne Ranger, huh? He said with a calm and cold voice without once looking at my face. Yes, sir. By no means did I feel confident about my decision at this point. I wondered about what would happen to me and what I had gotten myself into. Significant doubt overcame me at that point, and I began to feel dizzy. My heart pounded inside my mouth like a jackhammer in a construction site, tearing things up, making a deafening thump, thump inside my head. Stomach acid splashed up against saliva as I swallowed long and hard to try to keep from choking out. Their voices sounded muffled as they instructed me. Their lips moved, but I could barely make out what they were saying. Surreal. Visions of Roger Waters screaming at the lyrics to the wall filled my mind. I said, pull your pants down, son. What the hell did he just say? Are you allowed to tell someone to pull their pants down and say son at the end of that statement? The cold floor under my feet seemed more white than usual. I could see the specks of gray in the tiles as I looked at my toes while pushing my drawers down. I picked my left foot up and then my right. They were as heavy as cinder blocks. My legs felt like they had been filled with cement. Squat down. In seconds, I found myself walking while squatting as he watched. I wasn't sure if I was joining the military or the circus. What can we teach this monkey to do? He led me to a cold steel table and had me sit on it, checking my knees by hitting them with a small rubber hammer. He pulled out the stethoscope and put the cold, shiny, circular steel up to my chest. Relax, son. You're going to make it through this. Try taking a few deep breaths for me. Your heart sounds like it's going to beat through your chest. And we're going to need you for at least six years to try to relax. He smiled. I noticed, I noticed that he had one silver tooth and the sides of his mouth seemed to wrinkle beyond natural. The Cheshire cat came to my mind. Come on, Alice. Wake up. I was so numb, I didn't even notice him putting a stethoscope in my back. All I could focus on was my heart beating as if there were an alien inside of me trying to punch through my chest. Get off the table, turn your head, and cover your mouth. He stuck his finger right under my left testicle and wanted me to cough, which was impossible given I wasn't breathing to begin with. My vision was failing, my knees were shaking, and my mind was no longer understanding any human language. I was pretty sure that I was one step from running away if it weren't for being naked and somewhat numb. Okay, son, I'm going to put a glove on, and I want you to bend over the table with your forehead right on this spot, here, and your arms hanging onto the other end of the table. This is going to be unpleasant, but I'll try to be quick. Sorry, son. It's the price of becoming an airborne ranger. What the hell is he talking about? And then it happened. I banged my head on a table in disbelief as he invasively checked my prostate through my anal cavity. Was this really happening? I whispered, fuck, fuck, fuck. Yeah, something like that, son. But we have to make sure you're worth the investment. That wouldn't be the last time and something inside of me, something older than a 17-year-old, told me that there had to be a purpose to all of this. I couldn't help but think, why me, God? Why me? Thank you. As Michael Weller said earlier, 
we couldn't afford to do the veterans and caregivers workshops without the financial support and partnership that the Wounded Warrior Project provides. Ryan Cools is the alumni director for the Wounded Warrior Project. Ryan's alumni team facilitates over 4,000 events a year, providing warriors and their families the opportunity to connect with each other, including our workshops. I'd like to invite Ryan to say a few words. So I really drew the short straw tonight, having to go later in the program after listening to all those powerful stories, but uh, I'll get them back. So I don't really have much to add. The experiences shared through the power of the written word that you've heard from, uh, from the warriors and caregivers are ready and will hear, say it all. Uh, Wounded Warrior Product is extraordinarily proud to partner with the Writers Guild Initiative uh, and continue these workshops where warriors and caregivers are able to share their experiences gained through their military service and military experience uh, and, and write them down uh, so they can begin the process of healing from them. These are immensely, immensely powerful workshops. And as displayed this evening, uh, you can see just a taste of uh, what those experiences are and how they can help. We uh, uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the program and thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. And thank you for supporting the Writers Guild Initiative's writing workshops. One of the warriors who has benefited from those workshops is Javier Romo. Javier was raised in Southeast Los Angeles and graduated from Bell High School at the top of his class. He went on to study American literature at CSULB and dropped out at the end of his senior year to join the U.S. Marine Corps Infantry. He was deployed in February 2002 as a result of 9-11 and served as a forward observer during the invasion into Iraq in March of 2003. He separated from the Marine Corps in 2007 as a proud sergeant. Please give a hand for Javier Romo. Thank you for that introduction, and thank you for joining us all today. I'm here to share uh, a glimpse of my journey. It's a journey that's shadowed by countless veterans. I believe in your program, it's titled Sureños. Let's read it today as Welcome Home. <laughs> the brief moment standing in front of the huge iron cold doors with the deputy standing behind me seemed to go on endlessly. I was certain the deputy could see the sweat beating and trickling down the back of my neck. I could feel the deputy's breath on my shoulder like a smoldering cigarette that burned into my skin, heightening my anticipation. What was being held back by those huge doors that I was being led to? Finally, after what seemed an eternity, the roaring crash of the slamming door drowned out my racing heart. A huge mass of shirtless rival gangsters stood in front of the door in a semicircle, their eyes peering toward the doorway. A putrid smell of disinfectant blended with urine, the stench of last night's alcohol, and an array of drugs, including the chemical smell of meth emitting from the human skin, filled my nose as I was urged through the doorway by the, deputy, by the deputy's gloved hand against my back. The cold concrete clashed with the hot, moist skin. As I stepped through the doorway, suddenly the door slammed shut behind me and left a sudden awareness of fear and aloneness. I felt for my M16, only to feel a void by my side. I was defenseless. A month ago in Iraq, 
A month ago, Iraq seemed like hell, but today I wished I could be back there with my Marine brothers, who always had my back. The choreographed chaos of firefights seemed trivial now. How would I survive this? I could feel hundreds of eyes glaring at me and sizing me up. I looked up at the group standing in front of me and noticed that they were all standing together, yet separated by ambiguous borders. To my left were the black gangsters. Next to them were the Mexican southern gangsters, mainly, mainly many proudly displaying their Sudeño tattoos on their necks and face. Then the white supremacists, who all seemed to tear me apart with a mere glance. The northern Mexican gangsters stood to the far right. My attention turned, to the, turned back to the white supremacists, the first obvious enemy for a dark, for a dark skinned Mexican with brown hair and brown eyes. Several noticed my second look at them and took the opportunity to flash their white power swastika tattoos. Today was not the day to avoid gang affiliation as I did growing up. The white supremacist and black gangs were obviously not an option. It was a simple matter of power and numbers and clearly the Southern Mexicans had that down. As I stepped toward the Southerners, a tall, bald, muscular man in his 20s marched toward me. He looked tall, he walked tall, his shoulders back with, conf with the confidence of a leader. His gait was certain and deliberate as he approached me. He stood within a few inches of me and paused to look at me for several seconds that seemed to tick away like hours. I didn't speak, but I was sure not to break eye contact. That would surely be a mistake. When Hector finally spoke, I was shocked at the absence of gang lingo in his language. I'm Hector, he said. You don't know who I am. You don't need to know who I am, where I came from, or why I'm here. I run the politics here, and I write the law. Those are my soldiers, looking back at his men who are watching intently and waiting for his approving handshake. Who will you run with, Hector asked. With you, I said. Then you do as I say, he demanded, as he stretched out his hand for me to shake. He turned away and glanced back for me to follow him into the crowd of Sudanios. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. Before we go, we have one more warrior who has been gener enough, generous enough to share her story. Trista Modesti, I'm sorry. Trista. <laughs> Trista Modest Castile served 16 years in the Navy, Marine Corps, and Army National Guard, where she served as the first woman air defense officer and female commander of the 34th Military Police Company. Trista currently serves as the Veterans Voices Program Officer with the Minnesota Humanities Center and as chair of the Women's Veterans Initiative, a nonprofit advocating for equality that develops programming specific to the needs of women veterans. Trista is a contributing author, author of the Attorney's Guide to Defending Veterans in Criminal Court and has become a frequent blogger and public speaker. Trista was honored as the 2011 Woman Veteran of the Year. She and her husband, Hector, who you met earlier, live in St. Paul with their five sons. Please give one last warm welcome to Trista Mata Castile. It's August 24th, 1992. I'm in my bedroom cleaning up and packing a small bag of required items for basic training. Tomorrow, I will journey from Little Falls, Minnesota to Orlando, Florida to become a sailor. I've waited for this day for 17 years. I fold the eight pair of underwear and two sports bras with my name carefully written on the inside seam and put them in the small backpack. Soon, these will be the only pieces of home I have. 
the realization of this makes me pause. My childhood home was like the one drawn by a child. You know, the one with the house, with the windows on the front that make it look like a smiley face, and the green grass and lollipop trees, and the birds that look like flying M's, complete with a golden retriever. There were certainly tough days and hard times. My grandmother, who was my best friend, died when I was 10. The surprise discovery that my father had a secret daughter who was born two years before my parents even met. Then puberty. That was ugly. I had braces to correct my ridiculous overbite and a perm that looked more like someone who had survived an electrical shock and a body that grew faster than the girl who resided inside. There was the year that mom drank too much, waiting for dad to return from the war in the Persian Gulf. It occurs to me that everything has been different since the war. My father has been more distant and looks like he's seen things or done things that shouldn't be talked about. I hear a quiet knock on the door and I look up to see my father. It was very rare for my father to initiate a conversation with me, but I'm happy to see him. This is the moment I've been waiting for. The one when he, as a seasoned first sergeant, shares his years of wisdom with me. I'm prepared for him to tell me he's proud of me. My two older brothers are already on active duty, and I know he's proud of them. I hold my breath and feel the butterflies in my stomach as he sits on the edge of my bed. He has that look again. I almost don't recognize him. His voice is uncharacteristically soft as he pats the bed next to him and asks me to take a seat. <clears throat> Trista, things are going to be very different for you now. With all the smugness of a sassy 17-year-old girl, I roll my eyes and think, no, duh. There will be men who are interested in you in ways you won't understand. Seriously? I'm about to leave for basic training, and all you have now is the talk about the birds and the bees? I guess it's a good thing he doesn't know I lost my virginity at 15. This is supposed to be my hallmark moment, where he gives me wisdom for life. Where's the, I'm proud of you? Hardly able to conceal my disappointment, the only words I can utter are, I'm going to serve my country. Trista, you're going to meet people who don't look like you and, or have the same background as you. I can see he's searching carefully for just the right words, yet I wonder where he's going with this. Trista, he deeps, breathes deeply. If you fall in love, just be careful. If you bring someone home who truly loves you, I will support you. But just know there are men who will say they love you and that don't, and they'll scar you for life. You will never be able to recover from a bad reputation. I can't believe what my father is saying. What a disappointing farewell speech. He pats me on the head as he leaves. It will take me 16 years to fully understand what my dad was trying to say to me. It's never been so clear as it is today, the day of my change of command, my last day in the army. Now it's my turn to give some kind of farewell speech. What will I say to the soldiers standing before? I'm forced to reflect on my own journey. The Navy, funny, I remember so little about that now. Nearly eight years of my life and my memory of it is cloaked in darkness. So much had happened, yet the details of my service escaped me, except for the details of that night. The sickening 
musty smell of his body, his teeth like a pit bull on my neck, unable and unwilling to release his jaw. The months following his attack, revealing the child growing inside my belly. Explaining my pregnancy to my chain of command, already carrying the label of divorced single mother. I left the Navy and joined the Marine Corps after Hunter was born to escape his bite and the scarlet letter that came with it. It was significantly harder life than with two small children in tow. I returned to my childhood home, unable to manage the Marine Corps and childcare on my own. My father welcomed me in deafening silence and a look that was vaguely familiar. My thoughts take me to Mother's Day when I had left the boys with my father. I returned to the house after, after a quick trip to town to find a trail of tiny wet clothing lining the shore of the lake and no car in the driveway. My heart raced with panic, not knowing for sure what had happened or who it had happened to. Thinking the worst, I instinctively sped to the hospital. Upon my arrival, I was ushered into the emergency room where I found my dad soaked in wet clothes holding my four-year-old son, Tavo, and Hunter's tiny, lifeless body lying in a bed with tubes breathing for him. The look in my father's eyes was becoming familiar, only this time his words were clear. I tried to warn him, but I knew he was really talking to me. Hunter survived the near drowning, but my marine career didn't. After the accident, Hunter was diagnosed with autism and the Marine Corps said, there's no room for a single mom with a retarded child. I shake my head at the memory. That's not what today is about. Today, I end my time in the Army. The Army accepted me when the Marine Corps cast me aside and provided me with a home, a home where I've been respected. I've held prestigious positions and been highly rewarded for my work. I've lived my life under a microscope as a female officer, working harder, longer, and faster than my peers. My secrets have been well concealed. But now, I'm choosing to leave this home. I take in the sight of the 225 soldiers gathering in formation, the familiar smells of the drill hall, and, the f and feel my toes in these old boots and realize I will take them off for the last time. Ma'am, are you ready? Sergeant Beck's voice startles me. I nod. I'm feeling butterflies in my stomach. I take my place before the soldiers just like I have so many times before. Finally, the words come to me. No long speech, just thank you. I pause for all of it. I turn to the incoming commander and salute and walk off the drill floor. My pace quickens until I'm sprinting. I don't look back. I can't look back. The tears are streaming uncontrollably now. I'm crying for the girl of long ago who drew pictures of home with green grass and popsicle trees and for the woman leaving the only home she's ever known. Mommy, mommy, will you color with me? Our and sweet five-year-old vo little voice interrupts my thoughts as he climbs up next to me. Sure, what should we draw? How about a house and a tree and some birds like this, Mommy? I smile, watching him draw a house that looks familiar from a time long, long ago. 
Oh, mommy, should we draw a dog too? I smile with butterflies in my stomach. I've been here before. Will I try to warn him? Thank you. These heroes are so inspiring. And as we're this close to Veterans Day, I hope that it makes all of us remember how indebted we are to all of these great people. I'd like to, before we leave, just to bring out all our veterans and caregivers for one final round of applause. I, I can't thank them enough for what they've given our country and what they've given all of us in this room and on the internet by sharing their innermost thoughts and experiences tonight. Thank you all for coming to hear their stories and witness their brilliant writing. They are not only our heroes, but they are talented, emerging writers. Let's honor these scribes one last time. Sharon Grassi, Lauren Levin, Jason Rowell, Hector Matas Castile, Javier Romo, and Trista Matas Castile, and of course, Harley. Thank you and have a good evening. <laughs>